Unfortunately, next week, I'm not here. So maybe you all package something for me. When I come back, I'll have a packed bazaar lunch from everybody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. We've been studying Hebrews and recently been looking at Hebrews chapter 11. And this is God's hall of fame. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, 1 and 2, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. And then he goes on to tell us about these elders. In the past few weeks, we've been looking at some of these elders, including Noah, the crazy ark builder. And today, our Bible reading talked about one more such elder, the man Joseph. In Hebrews chapter 11, he is talked about in verse 22. Hebrews 11, verse 22. And it says, By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of having your word and for sharing it. The privilege of having the Holy Spirit himself be our teacher. Father, we invite him that he will rule in this session. He will speak to each one of us, including myself, Lord, at the point of our need, to bring conviction and encouragement, reproof, and anything we need that you see. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Joseph and his life is a very, very interesting study. Perhaps it's the most eventful and inspiring study in the Bible, apart from the life of Jesus. A young man goes through many, many, many events, clear, precise descriptions of what he goes through. So right from Sunday school, these are favorite stories we read about Joseph's life. Growing up, he was with his father Jacob, and we all remember Jacob, the son of Isaac, who got a birthright through deceit. Isaac himself was the son of Abraham, so Joseph would be the great-grandson of Abraham. And Jacob remembered his roots and had trained his children up. Jacob himself had had Joseph at a very late age because he loved a young lady called Rachel, was prepared to work seven years for her. But when he was ready to marry her, his uncle did exactly what he, Jacob, had done to another person, deceived him and brought him Leah. So he married Leah by force and had to work another seven years to marry the love of his life, Rachel, and loved her supremely, but she didn't have children, and they prayed and prayed and trusted God till Joseph was born. Joseph was born, and within that time, Jacob was growing, and he remembered what had happened to Esau. Joseph was in the house when Jacob tried to appease Esau, sending some of the children ahead, some cattle ahead, to meet his brother Esau, to restore relationship. And he learned all this. He saw all this. Within these seven years, before the Bible starts talking about Joseph himself, Rachel also dies. And Joseph, the beloved child, loses his mother. We've heard about bereavements. Those who have lost mother and father, especially at a young age, you know the pain he must have felt. The Bible doesn't dwell on this too much. What went into the young man's life from the time he was born till 17? It doesn't tell us too much about it. But if you know Jacob and you know what he had come through, you would know that Jacob taught this little boy. He loved him. He loved him dearly and taught him of his father Abraham and his father Isaac and the testimony they carried, the covenant relationship they had. We find Jacob in Genesis, sorry, Joseph in Genesis. 
as a dearly beloved little boy who had been given a coat of many colors. Theologians say it wasn't really a multicolored coat, but it was a seamless coat that was worn by royalty, people of great importance. These were shepherds, so his elder brothers didn't wear clothes like this. It was a seamless cloth that you wore over, and the edges were what were multicolored. In any case, what it said every time anybody saw him was that this was a son of favor. This was a son dearly beloved. This is my beloved son, Jacob was saying, in whom I am extremely well pleased. So every time you saw Jacob, Joseph, in this robe, this is what he told you. The brothers didn't like that. The Bible says they hated him because their father loved him more than them. To add to this, the Bible says Joseph continuously brought to his father their evil report. They were serpents, and when they went to watch over sheep, he would go with them, and he arrogated to himself the role of supervisor. So when they didn't do well, he came back, and he talked to CEO that these guys, they spoil their business. And they didn't like him more for that. To add to that, he was a dreamer. He kept dreaming these dreams. And he would tell them that, look, I dreamt and my sheaf, bundle of harvest, my own was standing upright, and yours, 12, around me, you kept on bowing before me. And one time he said, even the sun and the moon and the stars, they bowed before him. The brothers did not like him. They hated him. He had no malice. He loved them. And their father also loved them. It's just that this was the special child whose favor was genuine from him. The robe marked the favor, but the favor was apart from the robe. He loved them, but they hated him. How do we know he loved them? And how do we know the father loved them? They went to ten sheep, and they went away, and the father was concerned. How are they doing? And he sent Joseph to go to them. Where did he send them to? To a place called Shechem. What was Shechem like? In Genesis 33, Jacob had a daughter called Dinah, and Dinah had friends in Shechem. And Dinah had gone to Shechem to see her friends. And a young man called Shechem, the son of Hamor, saw Dinah and loved her and said, I have to get this girl. But not getting her the proper way, he took her and raped her. And then went to his father, Hamor, and said, go and do the necessary things and let me marry this girl. So Dinah went home crying and reported to her father and her brothers that this is what Shechem had done to me. So the brothers were enraged and they wanted to go out and do naughty things. And Jacob said, cool them down. But then these guys came up with a plot. They said, go and tell Hamor's people that yes, we'll give you our sister. But in our culture, you have to be circumcised. So all the men, let's circumcise you, and then you come. So one night, Hamor, the Bible, uh, Shechem, the Bible says, was the most honorable among these people in Shechem. Can you imagine it? The rapist is the most honorable. But because he was so honorable, when he asked something, they all did it willingly. So they submitted themselves to mass circumcision. And the night when they were all weakened physically, and the men understand me here, these sons came and killed all of them. So Shechem was not a, a, an area Jacob's sons would be welcome. But Joseph is sent alone to a dangerous place. And this little boy in his robe of favor is all over this place looking for his brothers. And the Bible says when he doesn't find them in Shechem, he, goes back, he does not go back to report that, oh, letter of the law, I've obeyed you, I didn't find them. No, his love for them keeps asking, where are they? Seeking. And they said they've gone down to Dothan. And he follows them there. And when he arrives there, he sees them and he's rejoicing. I found my brothers. And what do they see? They see a multicolored robe dancing towards them. And they start hatching plans from far away. The Bible says they planned to kill him. When we read this, it's very simple. It's very straight. The Bible makes it so flat. But think about it. Your brothers, people you love, you get there happy that they are doing well. And what do they do? They catch you. They bind you up with the intention to kill you. The Bible doesn't say how Joseph reacts. 
But we have a clue much later in Genesis 42 when they see him in an elevated position. They say something. They say that we, woe is us. We are undone because this guy now, here he is. He will never forgive us. And then they say, for we saw the anguish of his soul when we were selling him, when we purported, we tried to kill him. The anguish of his soul. This was not a smooth experience for Joseph. It was a traumatic experience. And when one of them was so nice as to say, no, let's not kill him, they put him in their pit and they had a meal. They enjoyed themselves, your brothers, whilst he was in their pit. And one of them says, look, he's our brother. He's our flesh. Let's not kill him. Let's sell him. He's our brother and we sell him. The irony. And they took him out and they sell him for 20 pieces of silver. And many years later, another man would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Because in the law, that was the price of a slave. And when the slave would die, you paid 10 more. Jesus would come. A son, a beloved son, sent to his brothers to go and redeem them. Coming gaily, seeking that which is lost. And what do they do? They catch him and they kill him. So for him, it was 30 pieces of silver. They sold him. And that little boy is going away on camels and, and on, a, on a, a, a convoy, going into a place he's never gone before. All the stories he's heard about this alien, heathen nation. And he thinks, he sees his brothers disappearing into the, in the past, in the horizon. He'll never see his father again. 17-year-old boy. And he goes into this country where no one worships the name of the great Jehovah. No one knows about Abraham. No one cares. Alone, he gets there. And when he gets there, he's resold to Potiphar. Goes into a palace. Think about it. No clue. He goes there, and that is where the Bible says the Lord was with him. I don't think Jacob, Joseph looks around and he sees the favor of the Lord. But the truth is that the Lord was with him. And prospered him. The Lord being with you may not be determined by your circumstances today or how you feel. Two times in that chapter, the Lord says he was with him and prospered him as he was being sold into slavery. By conscientious labor and diligence to his Lord, he is promoted. And the Bible says Potiphar, a head of the executioners of Pharaoh, big post, he puts this alien little boy, everything in his charge, and he's being promoted in the house. And then comes along Mrs. Potiphar with her designs. And the Bible says Joseph was handsome, intelligent, favored. So she too has her plans. Just like for you, Satan will have her plan, his plans. And daily, consistently, eh? consistently, every day, his job took him into a place where he was consistently tempted. And yet he stood firm. And when the woman came to him, the Bible says he chose an opportune time when there was nobody there. He says, lie with me, lie with me. The Bible says, your, your hus my master, your husband, has not kept anything from me except you because you are his wife. How can I commit this great wickedness, he says, and sin against God? He didn't care about her. He didn't care about himself. He committed, cared about sinning against God. So whilst at some point they have taken his robe, the robe of favor, they took away that robe of favor by force. But the favor was not in the robe. It was in, on him, in him. Here too, another robe is took, taken. She, he leaves a robe that he may be free from sin. Every time Joseph leaves a robe, he moves on to better things. It doesn't appear so but he moves on to better things. So this woman takes the rope and tells her husband, he came to rape me. The husband listens to her naturally and sends him to jail. And in jail, he's there. There too, he starts to prosper. God says, there too, you are prospering. We don't define prosperity as going down to jail. So every step he takes that we think he's going down, the Bible is consistently saying God is prospering him. And when he is down there, the Bible says that the jailer recognizes this favor and grants him favor. And he's exposed to two criminals who have been put in jail. Many years later, another man has his lot with two sinners. Two people hanging on the cross with Jesus. One of them saved, one of them died. 
And just like Joseph, these two people, a chief butler and a chief baker. And the butler has a dream. And he says, in my dream, I had grapes. I squeezed it, put them in a chalice, and I was serving Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, Daniel, uh, Joseph tells him, it means you'll be restored after three days. So the beggar too comes up. I also had my bread, and I had levels of the bread. And on top of the top level, birds were eating. And he says, well, for you, it looks like they'll cut off your head. So in three days, they are both freed. Amnesty. President Kufour, President Mahama, they give amnesty. They go out. When they go out, the Pharaoh says, you, butler, I restore you to service and promote you. You, baker, executed. So David's, uh, Joseph's dreams are fulfilled. But he had told the, the butler, when you go, remember me. He who puts his trust in man is bound to be disappointed. As soon as he's elevated, he forgets completely, completely. Many of us, we put our trust in our husbands, our wives, our jobs. We keep on putting our trust in man. They will fail intentionally, non-intentionally, with their best intentions and designs, man will fail. It's God who never fails. So he shut up in prison while the butler enjoys life. And then one day Pharaoh too dreams. And he dreams that there are seven big fat cows standing by a river. And seven lingy lingy thinny thinny cows come up. And they chop all the fat cows. He doesn't understand this. There's one stalk and it bears seven heads of corn, fat he heads. Then another stalk comes up with seven tiny skinny stalks and they devour the big one. So he asks, who can tell me my dream? And it's at that point that the butler remembers, oh, there was somebody who told me my dream. So they call Joseph and Joseph explains the dream. And when he's explained the dream, Pharaoh says, how, what shall we do? Not only does he explain the dream, but he gives wise counsel on what to do next. So the Bible says that Pharaoh wisely says, if you can do this, then you are the best person to manage. So what happens? He's put in charge of everything. And at this point, in a very short time, he's about 34, 17 years of trial and torment. And in a very short time, he's become from prisoner the second in command in the whole nation. And he's actually, he has more power than anybody in the nation except by name. Nobody goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is like Queen Elizabeth, ceremonial. Every power resides in this child of God. I want you to note this very carefully because he shifts into another area of adversity, the adversity of settlement, when you've arrived, when you are okay. He's rich, he has authority, his every knee is bowing, not just the stars and the moon and the seas. Every Gentile nation, every Egyptian knee is bowing to Joseph. He's truly arrived as far as the world is concerned. If you and I were to write about Joseph many years later, if we look at our Sunday school books, that's this story I've told you is what we hear. Joseph's standing, Joseph's robe, Joseph's interpretation of dreams, the elevation, this is what we want to hear. But when we come to Hebrews 11 and God wants to talk about his hall of fame and talk about Joseph, he doesn't mention Potiphar's wife. He doesn't mention the brothers. He doesn't mention all these spectacular things. What does he mention? He says, Joseph, when he was dying, he gave orders about his bones. Hebrews 11.22. Let's read it. Hebrews 11.22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. This is what God finds important to put in his hall of fame. And you ask yourself, why? What is so special about giving instructions about your bones? As compared to all these stories that we've talked about. But there are a few things that we will notice about this matter. First of all, Joseph believed something. Joseph knew something that he believed that made him give those orders. Let's read Genesis chapter 15. Remember, Abraham is his great grandfather. And in Genesis 15, God is making some promises to Abraham. And he says, 
from verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall inherit you. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. And he believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. Then he, brought, he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Then he said to him, bring me a three-year-old haifa, a three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought all these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, No certainly, no certainly, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. This story, this event, normally you would find people are making a covenant. They would cut these animals in two and you would walk through it, signifying what happens if you break the covenant. You'd be worthy of being cut into two. So he does that. God makes him do that. But then he falls asleep and only God passes through. God's covenant is about, it's not, he's faithful to his covenant, himself, devoid of you. And it is this story that has passed down. It is this story that Joseph knew. That at this time in my life, as we congregate here in Egypt as Israelites, there will be a day when we move on. There will be a day when you go out of here. And it is this understanding of God's purposes is this appreciation of what God is going to do that he applies his faith to. That is what pleases God. The, the Jacob, his father, had also died in Genesis 50 when Jacob had come to Egypt and had settled in Egypt, in Goshen. He also had died, and when he died, he gave instructions. He said, bury me where Abraham is buried, Abraham and Sarah where Isaac and Rebekah, and where I buried Leah. That, there go and bury me. There was a natural affinity. Go and bury me in my hometown. That was natural. And so they buried him in his hometown. And the Bible says, after 10 days of mourning in Egypt, Joseph went to Pharaoh and said, my father wanted to be buried in a place called Machpelah, where the tomb was. So I want to go there and bury him. And Egypt said, go. And the Bible says in Genesis 50 that the, the big shots, all of Egypt, followed Joseph to go and bury his father. Mass exodus of Egyptians going to bury a Jew. Now, if they did that to his father, imagine what burial they would have given to him. The preacher Spurgeon says there's a tomb in Egypt of a certain name, and on it is, they've written the director of the granaries. Everybody believes that was the tomb that was meant for Joseph. But he's not there. That tomb is empty. It's next to a pyramid for the pharaohs or something. But he's not there. They would have given him a super funeral. What makes a man now say that, no, take my bones from here? At this stage, Joseph had had about 80 years of authoritarian living. His word was final. And this is a different kind of adversity, a different kind of trial. His authority is undisputed and he's wealthy but within this time 80 years consistently he never lost his faith when that young man arrived in Egypt 
There was not a single person who knew about Jehovah. Today, you and I, we go in our offices, and we can't even stand up for our faith for one day after, man after Sunday, even Monday. For 80 years, he had all that it took to forget about God. That was where his faith was truly tried. And he stood firm. He did not want to be associated with Egypt. He stood firm. Everything he had, extremely rich, but kept his faith. Not a single, the, the Egyptians did not care about God. They had all sorts of gods. The ten plagues was against every, every plague was against a god. They grew their gods in their gardens because they worshipped leeks and onions. Everything they worshipped apart from the living God. And it was in this situation that a young man is brought. But he had the grounding of faith. What will happen to you when you are transplanted from a place of rich fellowship into a certain way you are alone in Christ? Do you forget him? In your workplace, in your school, as you walk out of here, when there's no brother this and reverend that and fellowship this, is that a time to let go of God? For 80 years, Joseph held on to his faith. In extreme affluence, he did not have the mindset that grabbed the wealth he had. He had the mindset to relate to God's covenant people, to remember that I'm a Christian, and still kept himself apart from Egypt. He kept his faith. Joseph kept his faith. He still chose to be a shepherd, associated with... Indeed, when his family came, that was the trick he used to get the best land for them. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis 43. Genesis 43 and verse 32. He says, So they set him a place, and his brothers had come to him. He had forgiven them, and at some point he had been overcome with grief. And he went inside and cried his heart out. And then the Bible says he washed his face and came out. They didn't know he was Joseph. And when they came out, verse 32 says, They set him a place by himself, and them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. Because the Egyptians could not eat, eat food with the Hebrews. He was still, even at this point, set apart from the Egyptians. If we read Genesis 46 and verse 43, sorry, Genesis chapter 46 and verse 34. Joseph tells his father that when Pharaoh calls you, from verse 33, so it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say, your servant's occupation has been livestock from our youth, even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So even at this stage, Joseph was identifying with what was an abomination to his world. The Bible says what C.C. just read, in John 17, that we are not of the world. We are not of the world. Jesus says, I do not ask that, God, you take your children out of the world. They have to be in the world, but they are not of the world. When God allows you to have worldly authority, when God gives you wealth, what, does, what happens? What happens to your heart? Do you still have that pilgrim mentality? Do you still desire that I am focused on God? In, he, in Genesis 50, he says, I am dying, but God will visit you. And when he visits you, take my bones from here. Take my, carry my bones out of Egypt. I have been here. This is where I've lived my life. God meant it for good that I'll be here to save his people. But I still have a pilgrim mentality. I've not dropped anchor and tied myself to this world. I know that God's promise for a better place is coming. So carry my bones and take me away. Don't even bury me like Jacob asked me, but carry it and take me to that promised land. And this is the faith, the faith that God will honor his promise over generations, no matter how long it took. All the trials, all the patience, carry me because God is faithful. And this is what pleased God. This is what put him in the house of fame. God is faithful. 
It wasn't just when he was standing firm. That was important. But what pleased him was to take an action based on this faith and tell his people, move me out of here because this is what God wants, is going to do, and I want to be a part of it. What do you do here? What, do you, what does the world mean to you? Do you approach it with this same pilgrim mindset that there's something ahead? They say, God has promised, I am coming again something ahead or do we allow what god favors us with to help his church like joseph did he says you meant it for evil he told his brothers but god meant it for good that i will be in this position to help the brethren the children of god is this how we see our authority and our wealth that we will still have a spiritual mindset and not chain ourselves to this world he used his wealth to bless. And if he had no wealth, because of that mindset, he would still have been in the fellowship of believers. So now we have a box, a coffin, a coffin full of bones that we are carrying around everywhere we go. Forty years they were in the desert and they were carrying these bones around. It was a testimony. Every time you see the bones, when you were in Egypt and you relaxed and you became comfortable with Egypt, you will see the bones and you will remember that there is something coming. I need not tie myself down. Jesus Christ said, every time you eat my bread, my bread and my blood, you do this in memory of me. Memory of what? That someday he's coming. We are not of this world. We are moving on. And so when he blesses us, we don't create roots and stay here. A pilgrim mindset is what God put in the hall of fame. Remember what Jesus has done. Remind yourself, every time anybody was discouraged and traumatized by this world, you look at those bones and he'll say, yes, these bones tell me there are better times ahead. The bones were a testimony of what God had promised and what God was going to do. When they fought in the wilderness, when they erred in the wilderness, all that time, somebody was carrying Joseph's coffin of bones for 40 years. The Bible says on the night, in Exodus chapter 13 and 19, on the night they left Egypt, Moses made sure that they carried the bones out. And this was a testimony. He had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. This was testimony to them too. Half Egyptians, half Israelites. But he wanted them to remember where he lay. If you have children, what, where are you pointing them to? He was given a Gentile bride. He was given an Egyptian name, Zaphinath Panea. A dini, a heavy. <laughs> Zaphinath Panea. But he did not identify with Egypt. He still was Joseph, called of God, believing the promise of God, even when he was dying and it hadn't been done. It was a testimony to the Egyptians that your lifestyle is not what I'm about, that I believe in something that is coming on. I ask you, if I ask your work people, do you struggle for the earthly thing, the same thing they do? If somebody in your office does not know you, know Christ, does he see in you value in something beyond this world? Or you go along with them. You take Zaphina Pania and carry it high. Or you are still Joseph in your heart, seeking the city that Jesus alone builds. Things to come. Or are we constrained by the world as we sink deeper and deeper and deeper into the things of the world? Or we are challenged to believe God that he truly will come again. And that every promise he's made, the Bible says, is yes and amen. Every time we seek God's promises, we seek it in relation to the world. But there's many, he says, the Hebrews 11, he says, all these people, they sought a better city. And that is what he applauds them for. They lived their lives in the consciousness that they are pilgrims. Abraham was filthily rich, but the Bible says he dwelt in tents looking for a city that is beyond. That is what pleased the Lord. That is what pleased the Lord. And finally, he lies there and he says, I am dying, but God will visit you. Yes, we will all die. All die, be die. We will all shut our eyes and die. But no, all die, no be die. This die is different. It's a die of hope. It's a die that he's relaxed, that the God's testimony will come to pass. So after many years, we read in Joshua 24, 32, that finally they came and they buried his bones. They buried his bones in Shechem. They came back to the Canaan. At the time he said it, 
nobody, no Israelites would have thought that they would need to get out of Egypt. They were comfortable. They were wealthy. They had Goshen. It was the most fruitful part of Egypt. Nobody dreamed that they were going to go out of Egypt. Even if they had, they would have known that if they purport to leave out as slaves, Egypt would immediately crush them. So even when he was making this statement, it was a physical impossibility that they would leave Egypt. But a few years down, like God had told Abraham, they would be there 400 years and they will move out. And he knew that and he believed it. Just like today, God is saying that I will come again. As improbable as it may seem, as unlikely as it may seem, he says, I will come again. So base your decisions, base your actions, base what you do on that promise. Let your bones go forth on that promise. And that when it comes for you to die, as we will all do, you will know that, yes, my faith will put me in God's hall of fame, the proper hall of fame, not Hebrews 11, the book of life itself, where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. These things are transient. The world is transient. The world is transient. And we we are foolish when we dig our heels in and think that is all there is. Genesis 1 starts in the beginning God, and Genesis ends in a coffin in Egypt. The two appear to be poles apart in the beginning God, and the last verses in a coffin in Egypt. But no, there was more to come. The prophets were to come. Many, many were to come. And finally, the Christ was to come. He is a picture, a type of Christ. Joseph is a type of Christ. He's one of only two people in scripture that God says nothing negative about. Daniel and Joseph. Nothing negative. Abraham, Noah, all of them, they had major crises of sin. But Joseph, nothing negative is said of them. Daniel, never. And Joseph is a type of Christ. My sermon title I was given was Joseph the Arrogant Dreamer. Arrogant in quotes. His arrogance was no sin. When you have that burden of God, he will say it. The stand of a Christian is not arrogance. There was another one to come who was even more arrogant, who said, I and my father are one. You can't go to God but through me. He was even more arrogant. And yet he was the beloved, the truly beloved of his father. He was the one who was sold, a selling that led into death. He was the one who came to his brothers and they murdered him. He is the true picture of what Joseph is. And it is his word and his promise that we are called on to have faith in. The similarity between Joseph and Jesus is uncanny. Both of them made outrageous claims. Both of them were beloved by their fathers. Both of them regarded themselves as shepherds. Both of them were sent by their fathers to their brethren in dangerous territory. Both of them were hated by their brethren without a cause. Both of them were plotted against by their brethren. Both of them were severely tempted. Both of them were taken to Egypt. Both of them were stripped of their robes. Both of them were sold for the price of a slave. Joseph 20, Jesus 30. Both of them were bound up. Both of them remained silent and offered no defense. Both of them were falsely accused. Both of them experienced God's presence through everything. Both of them were respected by their jailers. The people who traumatized them finally respected them. Both of them placed with two prisoners, one who was lost, one saved. Both of them were about 30 when they started their ministry. Both of them highly exalted after suffering. Both of them took non-Jewish brides. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 that we, the Gentile church, we are the bride of Christ just like Joseph was giving a Gentile bride. Both of them lost their brethren for a while, and both of them forgave and restored their repentant brethren. Joseph's forgiveness is astounding. Even when he forgave them and they came and they settled there, when Jacob finally died, they started telling each other, yeah, maybe he forgave us because he respected Joseph, uh, Jacob. Now that Jacob has died, we are gone as. And then he called them and said, no, my forgiveness is genuine. It is real. This morning, um, my brother Alex was telling me that there are three responses we can have. The response of demons is that when you do good, they will repay with bad. The response of humans is that when you do good, they will repay with good. When you do bad, they will repay with bad. 
There is the divine response. When you do bad, it, he responds with good. And that is the response we should have as Christians. Not the demonic response of when somebody does you good, you pay back with evil. Or the human response of I pay you what you gave me. No, the divine response is to give good where there has been evil. And this is what he does. He says, God meant it for good. I hold no grudge. And that is what Jesus could do. Hang on a cross. Be crucified on a cross. When we look at pictures, they put a rope around his waist. History says it wasn't like that. The shame of hanging on a cross. The pain of hanging on a cross. And there he could still say, Father, forgive them. And he could still say that about you and I. The Father, forgive them. Both were visited and honored by all earthly nations. And that's what we've been singing, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. This is what Jacob did, Joseph did. He knew the promise of God. And that is what we challenge ourselves to. You cannot have faith when you don't know the promise of God. He was not some abstract imagining things. He knew what God had told his father Abraham. And it was that that he premised his faith on, his action on. That's why the Bible can say in Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we've not seen. He knew the promise. And I challenge you to know God's promise about you, his coming again, his power to be with you, to live in this world, and to bear testimony of his holy name. The, the promises of God, they are yes and they are amen, but do we know them? Do we apply our faith to them? He knew the promise of God and he had faith in the promise of God. And then he had the patience to wait for the promise. This man's patience was extraordinary. For 17 years, he goes through trauma without talking. For 80 years, he doesn't tell us. I always wondered what happened to Potiphar's wife. I've always wondered. The day he became prime minister, what happened to Potiphar's wife? Did he go and tell him, look, I never really did this. I mean, you and I would have probably sorted it out well. But he's forgiven. All that time is quiet. It's just quiet. His patience to see the working of God. And then finally to commit his bones to this long process. Still patiently knowing that God has said it. It will be done. When we pray and say, God, do it now. We say, amen. But when it tarries. We lose faith, persevere, endure. The journey may be long, but his promises will never fail. He will come again. His promises spoken for you, concerning you, in his word, not in some imaginative position you were in, in his word, will never fail. Though it tarries, the Bible says, wait for it. It will not tarry. And then when he had known it and he was patient, he worked. The things he did showed that he had this faith. And so James can say, faith without works is dead. He had the faith and he worked. Faith will manifest in work. Committing of his bones. Taking this action. Taking this step. Because he knew this is going to happen. Otherwise, all faith is just professing. Just talking. And it doesn't impress God. And the Bible says in Hebrews that when we do these things, we know the promise, have faith, obey and are patient. Then we have a hope that anchors the soul. That is what we've been reading in Hebrews. A hope that anchors your soul. When the vicissitudes of life come, the challenges, the problems, the death of a family member, the loss of everything, or the reverse of that, multiple blessings, authority, everybody bound before you. When all these things come, you still have an anchored soul that trusts in the promise of God and nothing else. That pilgrim spirit, that pilgrim spirit is what pleases God. And that is what we are being challenged to today. May God bless the reading of his word. I'd like us to read Hebrews chapter 11 in conclusion. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But no, now they desire a better, 
that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It is from this conclusion that he now starts talking about these ones who have their eyes set on the city that God has prepared for them. As you go home today, just ask yourself, who am I, Joseph or Zaphinath Panea? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the hope that anchors. This hope is not a speculative hope. It is the hope that is expectation. And just as a woman who is expecting a child knows that after nine months she will have that child, this hope you have given us knows that the vision will surely come. And therefore we can have this pilgrim mindset that has faith in your promises that you will come again and so we will not be swallowed up by Egypt. We will not be swallowed up by our world but we will honor you knowing that we are passing through. We thank you, Father. And when it comes time that we shall die, may we die joyfully knowing that there are better things ahead. We pray these things and ask that you will help us to hide your promises in our hearts, to remember that you are a faithful God and your word will never fail. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. He has promised he will never fail. I will hang on him. He has promised.